This is a CBS News special report. The flight of Apollo 9. This afternoon, the separation and docking of the Apollo 9 spacecraft. Brought to you by Western Electric, manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell System, as part of our continuing coverage of important news events. Reporting from the CBS News Apollo headquarters, Kennedy Space Center, correspondent Walter Cronkite. The launch in the first orbit and a half of Apollo 9 have been almost perfect, and the spaceship is now uh, over Australia, approaching the east coast of Australia, and we've just been advised that already it has performed the first maneuver, a little bit ahead of schedule, apparently. It has already separated from the third stage of the rocket and has turned around and is facing back toward the third stage and the garage where the lunar module is parked waiting docking, which is the next important maneuver, another 10 minutes away. What has happened is that the S-4B, uh, that is this large third stage, inside of it at the top uh, is the lunar module. Uh, they have separated the command and service modules. They did that with a little 400 pounds of thrust from four of these 100 pound thrusters along the uh, rim of the service module. And they just went away at, oh, about two-thirds of a mile an hour. And they drifted out 50 feet away. At that time, with their heads down about 10 degrees like this and yawed over some 15 degrees, now they have come up in a slow maneuver that took them about 45 seconds until their heads are now up and they are facing back toward the uh, third stage. Now, in the meanwhile, we haven't had confirmation yet waiting for it. These slaw panels, that is the spaceship lunar adapter panels have blown away. Uh, this cover doesn't exactly represent it. It comes apart like a petal in four parts and blows away. We haven't had confirmation that has happened yet, uh, but it will, and we uh, hope to get that confirmation shortly. They'll station keep here about uh, 10 to 15 minutes, 50 feet away. Now, this S-4B engine may be venting a little fuel, uh, that little bleed off may be coming out of the uh, nozzles here in the back. If that is the case, it is accelerating a little bit. If that's the case, David Scott, the command module pilot who is flying this ship, will actually back up so that he keeps that relative position of 50 feet. Then when he gets ready to dock, he, he may let the S-4B, if it is indeed accelerating, catch up with him. Or he may continue to back just enough so that their closing rate is one quarter of a mile an hour. And you can hardly walk that slowly until they finally get in here like this. And with a probe on the end of the command ship, he will fit that probe into a funnel-shaped drogue, it's called, on the nose of the lunar module. He has only one foot of tolerance, and he can't even see that position. He has to line it up with a little crossbar that is up here on the, uh, on the side of the lunar module with a reticle in the window of his command ship. Then he'll bring that in at that quarter of a mile an hour, very gently. It can't stand a great deal more than that, a very delicate thing this lunar module is, and he will dock with it. Then they will stay in that position for some time, uh, testing uh, the dynamics of the situation until finally springs are ejected here on a command from the command ship and the whole thing is withdrawn from the S-4B third stage, which can then go on its way eventually into an orbit around the sun. That's the maneuver they're performing this afternoon at this point. Let's look back at our animation of this event now to give you another view of how that all works. And then we'll be listening in to mission control as the spaceship gets over the command stations in the Pacific and we hear the actual maneuver. This is the entire third stage and this is the separation. The slaw, as it's called, panels fall away and the command module attached to the service module, which contains all of its propulsion and life support equipment, or most of it, uh, pulls away. It gets out there about 50 feet, and then we'll turn around. That's a comparatively slow maneuver, the turnaround. It takes them 
45 seconds to go through the entire 180 degrees. In other words, if that were the second, the end of a second hand on a watch, it uh, would take it a minute and a half to make one revolution. And then they finally come up, heads up, facing back toward the uh, third stage and looking right down into that docking collar of the lunar module. If you've been with us uh, earlier today, that spectacular launch of the Apollo 9, uh, you would have heard the earlier descriptions of the fact that this lunar module experiment is the reason for Apollo 9. When they withdraw that lunar module uh, from the third stage and uh, get out uh, flying it alone, they're on the way toward testing the equipment we're going to have to use to get a man onto the surface of the moon and back later this summer. We expect an announcement here from Mission Control and ought to be able to hear, we hope, some of the communication from the spacecraft, which has been quite good. Let's listen Hawaii in. Hawaii has acquisition now. We'll stand by. And Apollo 9, this is Houston. Uh, we should have you through Hawaii. Standing by. Roger. The voice you'll be hearing from Houston is that of uh, Major Stuart Stu Rosa, an astronaut, a member of the Apollo 9 support crew. And which voice we hear from the spacecraft will depend on the maneuver at the moment. The maneuver is being performed by the command module pilot, David Scott, the 36-year-old Air Force Colonel. He's flying this mission to get himself plenty of practice with this docking maneuver because he's going to be the only man in the command module after Commander McDivitt and Lunar Module Pilot Schweikert take off in the Lunar Module for their six-hour flight, in effect circling the command ship, which keeps on a steady course. They circle it up to 100 miles away and eventually come back and dock again. And Scott will have to be doing that docking maneuver, which will be critical to the safety of all three astronauts, and particularly Schweikert and McDivitt. They want to give him a lot of practice at docking. These circumstances, which cannot be duplicated on Earth in any kind of training maneuver, because we can't duplicate weightlessness on Earth. Despite the hundreds of hours these men have spent in simulators, it's a little bit different once you're circling the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour. 118 miles high and in a weightless condition. While we're waiting for further communication from the spacecraft over Hawaii, CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 9 will continue in a moment. Four hundred and sixty-one individual separate, distinct parts. They don't mean much to you yet. In fact, not until Western Electric puts them together. Precisely, efficiently. Then all 461 parts turn into a bell telephone so that you can dial almost anywhere. To help you keep in touch, Western Electric backs up your Bell Telephone Company by making dependable phones and things that connect them. Does our name ring a bell? Yes, millions of them. We haven't heard anything yet uh, relayed through the Hawaiian station to Houston, the vast and complicated communications network of uh, NASA operates in such a fashion that the ground stations uh, spotted at the proper spot places around the globe 
uh, take the communication directly from the spaceship and then relay it uh, almost instantaneously uh, to Houston so that the capsule communicator, so-called, an astronaut, on the desk at the Mission Control Center in Houston is speaking directly to the spaceship through a relay on the ground elsewhere. This ground relay is Hawaii, and we've had no communication at all. The earlier communication, however, as the uh, spaceship was uh, over the tracking station Huntsville, a ship a thousand miles south of Fiji uh, in the Pacific Ocean, was that they had already separated uh, from the uh, from the S-4B third stage, as we reported, had turned around and were looking back at the LEM. The docking maneuver should be taking place now in that they should be beginning the very slow approach uh, to the LEM. At this point, the LEM is passive. That is, uh, it and the S-4B are simply maintaining their position, except for that slight acceleration due to venting, which we mentioned a moment ago. The command ship is the active ship. It is approaching to make the rendezvous. Now, later on in the mission, on the fifth day, the critical fifth day when Schweikert and McDivitt cast off from the mothership and make that long trip out into space, testing for the first time this very delicate spider-like uh, flying machine called the LEM, they are going to be the active rendezvous ship. That is, they will come back and have to make the rendezvous with the command or mothership, which will remain steady in orbit. That's the same way that it'll be done when we send men to the surface of the moon and back. Throughout that mission, however, Scott, flying the command ship alone in it, must keep track of every part of the maneuver, follow it very carefully, and be prepared at any moment to do what is called a mirror image uh, maneuver, a mirror maneuver, uh, which would be the same maneuver that the LEM is scheduled to do, but in reverse, so that he could become the active ship and go after and capture and hopefully dock with the LEM. If the LEM had a malfunction that made that necessary, uh, the problems on Scott's shoulders would be immense. If he could achieve docking... ...control at 2 hours 57 minutes. The Redstone has acquired Apollo 9 now. There's been no air-to-ground conversation as the crew is busy station-keeping and visually inspecting the lunar module and the SLA. We'll continue to stand by for any conversation. That is Jack Riley at Mission Control in Houston. Sounds very much like Paul Haney, who was the voice on every one of these missions from Mission Control uh, through Gemini and the early Apollos. Uh, Paul Haney took this mission off from the voice job uh, to supervise, as he said, but also to get a chance to watch for the first time live a launch, which he watched from the uh, Space Center here today, and he'll be the voice again on 10 and 11. So we were saying a moment ago, if the command ship has to make be the active participant in making the rendezvous, uh, later on, on the fifth day of the mission, Scott will have quite a job. On nine, uh, Houston, we've got you through the Redstone, standing by. <laughs> Houston, uh, we're about 25 feet now on the closing floor. Uh, copy. Said they're 25 feet away. That means they've closed half the distance of the 50 feet that they originally were scheduled to separate. Apollo 9 is free to dock whenever the crew feels like they want to. They will not have to await a go from the ground. Flight plan schedule shows it about three hours over California, but the crew is free to dock. Uh, when they uh, desire to. The crew apparently separated uh, before they had uh, their schedule called for them to by almost five minutes. Uh, the ground seemed to be quite surprised when they called up to uh, apparently update data and to get set for the separation and the turnaround and they were told that uh, the spaceship already had separated and turned around. 
But now they're perhaps going to take a little more time with the docking. They have closed about half the distance. Have another 25 feet to go at around 25 hundredths of a foot per second. which quickly uh, translates into 100 seconds by uh, my amazing mathematical mind. Probably turns out to be wrong. We're keeping an ear cocked here for further word. That is a excellent representation of the target that Scott is now aiming at. Uh, that black crossbar you see right in the middle of the, uh, of the representation of the LEM surface. He is getting that crossbar aligned with a, a uh, position on a reticle etched into the glass of his docking window. And by keeping those lined up, he moves in and edges in. He cannot see the actual nose, the docking probe, or the drogue on the limb. This picture is of the mock-up of the spacecraft and the limb out at North American Rockwell at Downey. Terry Drinkwater is out there uh, with Leo Krupp, the North American astronaut engineer, uh, in our mock-up spacecraft. Terry, uh, maybe you could tell us what they're doing right at the moment. Yes, Walter, this, this is the view from the LEM, isn't it, Leo? That's right. Well, we have a Create a silence from Terry Drinkwater and Leo is from McDivitt, Schweikert, and Collins. Walter, do you read us now? Oh, no, no, I do. Uh, Sorry. My fault. Wrong button in, push. Inside, uh, inside here, uh, we are looking out uh, towards the LEM as, as we approach. Uh, Leo, what, what's exactly happening at this point? Well, I assume uh, Dave is staying keeping and trying to get his translational errors nulled out on the standoff cross. Uh, excuse me, gentlemen. We just... Transmission's a little garbled, but they did say we are docked at 3.02.08 into the mission, two minutes and eight lock. seconds after three hours. They also said they got a master alarm uh, in their sensing equipment uh, as they docked. They're reading that out now. They had said earlier they were getting...